to speak the truth about the injustices in education using comedy as the vessel for change. I don't want to hear any complaints. Don't like it? Find another job. Don't buy shit. Honestly, I wish I could scream this out of the top of my lungs. I was so good at that. Listen, Vlad, you listen to me. Okay, I don't want these teachers spending any of their money. Why? Because, girl, you don't got it. Let's just call it like it is. You don't got to stir the pot, baby, because I always keep it boiling. It happens, yeah. We're going to have to bleep out all these. Those people in those positions have never stepped foot into a classroom. Every child who is born in this country or is in this country, period, deserves the right to have not only an equal education, but an outstanding education. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features in-depth interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Whether you're seeking inspiration or simply looking to learn something new, The Avenue of the Strongest has something for everyone. Now, get ready to meet one of the most funniest and most talented performers out there. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome Joe Dombrowski, also known as the one and only Mr. D, to our podcast. Back up. I got three minutes before the kids come back and mama's got copies to make. Joe is a stand-up comedian and former elementary school teacher hailing from the vibrant city of Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> Currently on a nationwide tour, Joe has been making audiences roar with laughter in cities across the country. If you haven't seen him live yet, be sure to visit mrdtimes3.com and get your tickets before they sell out. Trust us, you will not regret it. I was also not prepared for the fact that kindergartners lose their teeth at the rate of a great white shark. <laughs> Joe has taken the comedy world by storm, making appearances on TV and news channels, and even gracing the stage of the iconic Ellen DeGeneres show multiple times. Is it like, <laughs> thanks for liking it uh. and sharing it? They just told me backstage, they're like, Ellen, watch your video, and she was cracking. I'm like, Ellen knows who I am. <laughs> With his unique perspective and quick-witted humor, Joe is a true master of his craft. So sit back, relax, and get ready to hear some amazing stories and insights. Joe, welcome to the show. Oh, what an intro. I love, you know what? You know what comedians love? Hearing about ourselves. So that was, that made my day. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that. You know, I, I will tell you, the intro is the hardest part to write, at least yeah. for me. Uh, because, you know, I, I always find that to be the biggest struggle. But you know what? I do love your bio on your social media channels. That's the first thing that stuck out to me when I was doing research. I mean, I, I actually knew you beforehand, but I know Vlad reached out to you and, see, and, and saw, hey, would you come on and talk with us? I love your bio because on your About Me section, it reads, don't get it twisted, though. It takes at least 20 years to be an overnight sensation. You're correct. Most success stories are not overnight and are the result of years of hard work, tenacity, grit, and perseverance. This message is so important to get across, especially to young students. So first of all, thank you for putting that across all of your about me and social channels. But I want to get to know a little bit more about your journey since your third grade talent show and all of those years of persistence till today. You know, it's really amazing because I do get a little bit of a, a reputation in the industry of being a quote unquote social media guy or a social media comedian or an influencer. Now, don't get it twisted because I'm smart enough to play the game. I know that this world of comedy, you don't make it unless you're pulling those numbers. People find who you are through social media. So yes, I have a big following and baby, it's working for me. But what a lot of people don't know is, yeah, my first stand-up set was in the my my third grade talent show when I was right. eight years old. I remember oh. I did a, um, a project, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote, I wanted to be a zoologist or a comedian or Jim Carrey. I want to just be Jim Carrey. <laughs> so, and, and as life progressed, you know, I was always the funny friend. I was always the friend that people were pushing to the front of the line to do all the speaking when we were in projects in high school and college. I was always the presenter and uh, and I was and I was funny and it, that came naturally to me and I never stopped doing comedy. So I got serious about it in college and I joined an improv troupe and I started playing around with sketch comedy and stand up to kind of figure out where in this space I really wanted to fit. And then uh, after college, I was still doing comedy to yeah, because I don't know if you know this. Teachers are, um, God, what's the word? Uh, poor. 
So, <laughs> so I was doing comedy to put gas in my car to get to work. Yeah. You know, supplemental, you know, a $20 spot here will buy me lunch there. It was just kind of a really nice way to have a little extra cash on hand because as a teacher, you're strapped for it, especially in your first five years. Right. So um, continuing to do it, continuing to do it until it blew up to the point where I'm able to, you know, tour globally and do it. But the best part, the best part about that is as my success started to grow locally in Detroit, and then eventually I went on the Ellen show and then I started doing shows all over. The coolest part was being able to look at my kids, the students in front of me and say, if you have a dream, you can do it. I'm mm -hmm. doing it right now. You're watching yeah. me do it. Yeah. And they still, there are a lot of my students are in college now and they write me telling me, how much that message meant to them to yeah. see it live in action before them. You know, wow, that's amazing. You can talk it all day, but when they see you walk in it, that's a game changer, man. No, that's amazing. And listen, I have a I have a personal question over here. Do you offer private coaching sessions on how to be funny? Because I am the least funny person that I that's what I get. My friends tell me all the time, you know, I need to be more funny. So you, you have to be more of a risk than a pro yeah, exactly. I know. But you know what, Joe's he's he's a professional now. He's an expert. He's been, he's been an expert since third grade. So I, I definitely think Come on, that he was doing show already from eight years old. What do you want? <laughs> Let me say this, this timing on that question is hilarious because I'm actually a guest speaker at a beginner's comedy class tonight here in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so come on over. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We'll, we'll just hop on a plane. Which, yeah, we'll where is it? Which state? Hours. You're in Seattle, right? Yeah, I live in yeah. Seattle now. I'm originally okay. from Detroit, but I, I do live in Seattle now. Got it. Okay. So I, I was watching one of your podcasts before and you said something that really stuck with me. Uh, I want to oh, dig God. a little bit deeper into that. <laughs> into that. Uh, no, don't worry. It's, it's very educational. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, you mentioned that you are using comedy as a vessel for change. As soon as you said that, I was like, oh, uh, this is like super important. Your goal is to get also more non-teachers to watch your podcast because they are usually the people that cause a real change in some of the ridiculousness that goes around in education. I don't want to, I do not want to stir the pot, but let's do it. Let's talk about some of the ridiculousness that goes around in education and why, in your opinion, non-teachers typically move the needle when it comes to change. Well, I mean, you don't got to stir the pot, baby, because I always keep it boiling. But yeah. <laughs> I, it is true. Teachers, we have our hands tied behind our backs and even more so for public school teachers, right? You cannot do right. anything because the red tape is just so thick. In order to move mountains for your students, there's just too much, too much in place uh, for you to actually make the change that you need to make. And the restrictions on what a teacher can do and, and the demands on, on the paperwork and what we have to do don't really allow us to do it. Plus, teachers are undermined left and right right by the government right okay? yeah. those people in those positions have never stepped foot into a classroom and the people who are funding a lot of public and private education are in the corporate world right and if you think about it these people are the stakeholders these are the people who are calling the shots not the teachers who are actually doing the job we know what we're talking right. about so for me i wrote my stand-up comedy show um it's not a teacher show it's a show right. about a teacher it is for everybody and the goal has always been to initially have the base of fans be all teachers and as they continue to grow they'll understand they can say to their friends you don't have to be a teacher you're going to find this so funny and they come to the show and they laugh i have more non-teachers than ever now and my right. favorite thing is when they leave and they laugh and they go in the car and they're still laughing and they say to the person they came with they go that was so funny but if you think about it that's so messed up that teachers have to deal with that we should do something about it. And if those yeah. people who are not teachers change their mindset and realize the, the curiosity that teachers have to deal with, those are the people who can actually put their money where the mouth is and start making change for education. So that's the goal. Comedy is the vessel for change. 1,000%. Yeah, 100%. So speaking of ridiculousness, let's move on to uh, next question. Uh, the National Education Association released some horrifying data in October of 2022, stating that educators in this year on average spent over $800 in out-of-pocket costs on school supplies. And your That's advice to estimate. teachers, <laughs> low estimate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so your advice to teachers was don't buy 
honestly, I wish I could scream this out of the top of my lungs to all the teachers out there. So to all the teachers out there, can you give them advice on how to buy the least amount of shit and how to spend less as a teacher? Here because you and I both know that teachers don't make shit. Listen, Vlad, you listen to me, okay? I don't want these teachers spending any of their money. Why? Because, girl, you don't got any. Let's just call it like it is. There are so many people. If you're a teacher and you're listening or you're a community member, just, just buckle up. Pull over because I'm about to preach the book of D. You, teachers have, are in the community, and there's so many people in the community who want to help the teachers and the students. They just yeah. don't know how. And all you have to do is ask. Every single place that I would go, I say, do you have a teacher discount? And they more often than not say yes. And they're usually very generous. And I even do this for my own personal shopping. Banana Republic, great teacher discount. The Gap, great teacher discount. Zara, oh, hello. Okay, I got to look good when I'm on the job too. And I earned that discount. Yeah. Yeah. But I would also, when they say we don't have one, I'd say, okay, can I speak to your manager? Not in a Karen way, but in a, you know, and I'd explain to them what I'm going to do. Best example I can give you. I was carving pumpkins with my students. We were using the seeds to make math multiplication grids. It's just a big project we were doing. And it was really fun. I didn't have $3 a pumpkin to spend. So I asked the manager, I was like, listen, this is the project I'm doing for my students. Can you help us out with a discount? He's like, yeah, I got a couple. I got a whole crate in the back of pumpkins that are just a little, a little off. Mm -hmm. Maybe the shape's a little different. They're not orange enough yet. You want them? Hell yeah, I want them. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I want them. I got 30 free pumpkins for my class. They were selling those pumpkins for, yeah, I know. And they were selling those pumpkins. And I'm like, yes, I'll get that for free. The other thing too, is I tell teachers, you have a class list, right? You have a wish list on Amazon. You have a wish list on whatever it is of, of products that you want for your classroom. Put that as a QR code with a little blurb about you and your classroom and go to as many local businesses with a stack of them and just ask, can I put this in the window? More often than not, they're going to say yes because they want to support you. People will walk by, read your story, scan that QR code, Boop, buy you something for your classroom right there. I've had teachers write me about this saying that they've had their entire classroom wish list funded in under a month because they put QR codes up in the community. People want to help you. They just don't know how. So don't spend your money. Don't spend the money you make. Make them spend it. So you said that $800 is a huge underestimate. So what's the real number there? Low ball. I I would say the average teacher per school year, a thousand minimum. Well, wow. I'd say that is minimum. crazy, especially given the fact of what teachers get paid. And we know because we, we own a preschool right here in Brooklyn. We have 27 full time teachers. Let me tell you, it's not pretty. Uh, you already know. So uh, so since we're talking about low salary, uh, let's talk about something a little bit more fun right now. OK, I'm going to share my screen uh, very fast over here. How corporate? Let oh, me share my screen. God. Yeah, let me share my screen. Over here. Let me see. <laughs> I'll zoom into this question over here. Oh, okay. So here is an image. This is a we we put out some uh, video. I even forgot what the video was about. Here's <laughs> here's here are two comments that we got. Now, Joe, you know that I'm not funny. I am not a professional. I'm not a professional educator and comedian like like you. I'm way too political of a person to devour these comments. So I'm going to leave it to you. You are the professional here. What would you like to say to these two individuals? In response to their comments, are these comments on, on, of any of my videos? Because if they are, you know I'm going to go back. To <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they are not. They are not. These are. So it was. It was another right. podcast that we had. But this is. This is the complaints. This is. This is what people like to post. So people who are listening and not watching, the first one is a comment that says, "Maybe if they weren't." St- at their job also this is what they chose to do i don't want to hear any complaints don't like it find another job and to which i would say okay baby well i'm pretty sure that none of the teachers want to be making this much so let's all quit then you can sit in your cubicle with your seven-year-old as they annoy the get out of you while you're trying to do your job with success do not come for me do not bite the hand that feeds you and i would also say 
I would like to be a fly on your wall and hear you complain about your job, okay? <laughs> Perhaps they should learn how to use a comma here or there. And also, <laughs> it's I-N-G, not I-N. Anyway, <laughs> the next... The next one reads, wah, wah, wah. So sad to see how so many people can't deal with life. This isn't a problem people should be worried over. There's more important matters than teachers or people's feelings. Bada boom. Let's knock this out of the park right away. So, yeah, there are there are more. There are bigger issues. Well, one of the bigger issues I can think of right off the top of my head is the fact that public schools are funded by property value in the given area. Therefore, we have public schools that are funded higher than some private schools where students are getting, given everything they need in order to be successful. Yet there are students in this world who are living in different areas who have not even one twentieth of the materials that those other students have. And people might sit here and say that was their choice to live there. That's the life they're given. They can overcome it. That, sure, we'll give it to you for a second. Not when we're talking about kids, not when we're talking about students. Every child who is born in this country or is in this country, period, deserves the right to have not only an equal education, but an outstanding education. So before you come at me with comments like this, think about what you should be complaining about, which is the injustice that we're doing to students in America. It's not equal here and it needs to be. Wow, that's incredible. Honestly, that's a nice answer. I'm, and I, I'm, you, you, you yeah, wouldn't I'm, be able to answer it like this. 100%. I would have. I, I wouldn't even. I, I can't even do one twentieth of what you just did. So thank you so much. I'm so glad I put that in there, because now this is the exact response we're going to go ahead and put these two profiles. Oh, and of course, the the profile they don't have a profile image. You know, it's a secondary. Oh account, uh, yeah, bad comments. Yep, it's like a picture of a meme. Mm -hmm. They don't got <laughs> anything posted, and that's the mm -hmm. thing about today. I cannot handle this. People think they can say anything behind the safety of their keyboard, and that's not true. You can't say anything yeah. behind the safety. Yeah. And people always ask me, they're like, why do you clap back? It's like, oh, I, you, the doors have been open. The floodgates are flowing. <laughs> we all know right now that you are currently on a tour and you have few shows in Spokane, Washington coming up, then Toronto, California, and many other states. So what do you do before the show? Do you get nervous right before the show? Maybe some rituals you do before you are uh, coming on a stage for a comedy show? I actually it's super weird. I don't get nervous at all. I get very, very, very excited. And um, you can, it's a, it's a energy experience. Like when you go out there and you hear the roar and you see the fans, they just feed the fire and are just stoking it, stoking it, stoking it to make the show better and better and better. Um, the only ritual that I really do have that I've actually never talked about on any interview is I record every single one of my sets on audio. I take my phone with me, record it on audio. And the first thing I do the next morning is listen to the set back. And anything mm -hmm. that I said that was new that I liked, I write it down because your brain's mm -hmm. great, but it can always be better. And I, I will, as much as I could remember, there are things that I would forget. So I sure. write down all the good bits that I said on the fly. And then I decide if I'm going to keep it or pitch it. And then I work it out, flush it out just a little bit, and then I'll do it again the next night. And that's kind of how you build an hour. Wow. I, I, yeah. I love that. Now, for I know for many years you were balancing between being a teacher and a comedian. Yeah. Recently, you made the decision to stop being a teacher in the classroom and pursue comedy with 100% focus. You, you talked about this in your social studies podcast. Uh, what was that journey like? I just, I just want to know that pivotal – was there like one pivotal moment where you realized like, that's it, you know? Like, I love teaching. I know you love teaching. We don't even have to go there. But like, hey, I need to pursue this 100% of my time. Yeah. It, uh, teachers can be perfectionists. And I will say that uh, although I'm not a type A, I do have perfectionism in my blood. And I always, str when I was in the classroom, I was always striving for what's called highly effective status, which means that you are, you've earned the highest ranking of professionalism in teaching, right? Uh, and my last year in the classroom, I, I didn't earn highly effective. I got one rank underneath that. And I questioned my administrator, my principal on that, um, because I thought that I had clear evidence that I was. And she said, you know, I'm going to be really honest with you. She goes, do I think you're a good, do I think you're a great teacher? She goes, I think you're good. Do I think you're a great comedian? Um, I think you're good. And she goes, I'll say this though. 
when you're splitting your time between two things that you truly care about, you can only be great at one of them when you allow the other to go. And she exactly. says, one of these things you have a degree for and can come back at any time in your life. And one of these things might leave you if you don't strike the nail while it's hot. And I looked at her and I said, so did I just get fired or am I quitting? I don't really know <laughs> where we go from here. But she, it was very matter of fact. And I think it takes a very strong leader to have a conversation like that with somebody who's clearly so passionate about both the things that they're trying to balance. And after some reflection, you know, I was heated in the moment. I went back and I was kind of upset by that. But after thinking about it, I was thinking, am I really giving my 100% best to the kids? And I was like, I don't. I don't think I am. And am I really yeah. giving my 100% best to my fans? I was like, I don't think that I am. So I left. It was a very scary thing to leave. But when I left, one of the most immediate things that I noticed was the fact that I was immediately making a bigger impact that I was in the classroom because I was speaking to the unspoken. And the number one thing that I hear after a show is teachers coming up to me saying, you say the things that I've always thought, but were never able to vocalize because I have a target on my back and I might lose my job. I no longer had the target on my back. And I was able to speak the truth about the injustices in education using comedy as the vessel for change. And that feeling was not only cathartic for me, but it was cathartic for audiences all over the U.S. And I realized that teachers hearing these words and being able to laugh about it sends them back into the classroom motivated and ready with a mindset of, I can get through this. This is really hard, but I can get through this. And if I'm doing that, I'm either teaching in the classroom and affecting the lives of up to 30 students that sit before me, or I'm traveling, doing shows to thousands of groups of people at a time. Where am I making a bigger change? Right. And I believe it's through comedy. 1000%. I, I, I love that, by the way. And I was actually going to bring it up, but you already brought that point up. As a teacher, you, you know, there's a limitation on what you can, what you can and cannot say. And now that you're out of the classroom, you're bringing so much whether it's stress relief or joy or the actual change from non-teachers, you're literally doing it. You, you are, you are seriously, Thank you. Thank uh, you. you are making, and I, I, you know, I watched a, a bunch of your stuff. Uh, it's incredible. And teachers really, and your, your show is not for teachers. It's for everyone. We, we know that, but it's, it's, I mean, I'm not a teacher, but we, oh, we, you know, we're in the education space, but it, it's such a fresh breath of air when we take a look at your content. You know, and you're bringing Thank so much you. joy to so many teachers and those teachers in return go back to their classrooms refreshed, you know, because you said some funny story about how administ how admin is horrible. They, you know, the, the teacher's already getting heat from the admin, but, you know, it's fine. They laughed about it because they watched your materials, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on a live show, they go back to the classroom. They had their stress relief, and now they can go ahead and go back into teaching the kids. So thank you so much for that. They are not alone out there, so... They, they feel the pain. They know that somebody can speak out for them. So I believe you, <clears throat> you have, you know, a bunch of stories, like crazy stories like this. So I want to actually ask you if you can share uh, some of the craziest stories you've heard from other teacher, or perhaps e even craziest story that happened to you while you were teaching. This is, this one's so simple and it cracks me up whenever I think about it. I don't know if you know, because the teachers, this job will age you like cottage cheese, okay? Like you <laughs> yeah. literally, you will walk into the classroom for the first time as a fresh-faced 22-year-old. You'll leave that same school year looking like a Sharpe that was crossbred with a melted candle. It's <laughs> bad, all right? So I dyed my hair probably, I was probably in like my seventh year teaching at this time, right? I dyed my hair and my class freaked out out and they were like why would you do that and i just said oh i just wanted to look a little bit younger and one of my students looked at me in the face and said but what are you going to do about your face though <laughs> and honestly it's little moments like that that just would keep <laughs> me on my toes oh my like, god like i had another little i had this little boy he reminded me of me when i was a little boy so y'all catching the drift so he got in this argument with a bunch of girls at recess and he looked at them. He said, Oh yeah. 
I know gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> just cartwheeled away. I was like, honestly, I'm obsessed with you and I love this job. So yeah, it's just those little things that make it. And, and that's the reason why I kept teaching for so long because mm -hmm. I could never do, I could never be a cubicle person, right? Where I'm just doing the same thing over and over again, crunching numbers or whatever they do. I need it to be different every single day and I needed it to be the utmost challenge and that is teaching. So now let's speak about your podcast, the Social Studies Podcast. You probably mentioned this on your podcast several times to your followers, so I'm sorry in advance for probably asking a stupid question, but I'd love to hear a story behind and how you settled the name uh, Social Studies for your podcast. I've actually never told that story. It's so funny. I was actually... Um... I was work I was at the gym and I was working out with one of my friends and I said, Yeah, I'm starting this podcast. I want it to be um I want the name to be kind of like tongue in cheek, sort of teaching, but not really teaching. Like, it, you know, kind of like the show. Like it's like it's for everybody, but it's kind of got like it's by a teacher. It's got a teacher flair. And he was like, Well, why not why not social studies? I was like, Shut up. What do you mean? And he's like, Well, social studies, you think about it. He's like, social studies the art of being social by being social um you're studying yeah. being social right. i'm like that's it that is it it's social studies which i may have shot myself in the foot a little bit because so many people don't give it a chance because they think i'm just going to be like on the podcast yeah. while they talk about abraham lincoln but once, <laughs> once you take one listen you know that we're getting social in a different way so yeah i'm on it with one of my one of my really good friends gasper randazzo who's a hilarious comedian and still a high school teacher in um, Staten Island, New York. And uh, we just have a good time. We don't, we don't always talk about teaching. We just talk about life. Teaching naturally comes up because that was our careers. It mm -hmm. still is Gaspers. And uh, we're just having a good time. We're just having a good oh, time. Oh, I didn't realize he was oh, from Staten cool. Island. Yeah, yeah. Check right, him out. He's got right, shows right, all over yeah. the city. Okay, Joe, let's play a quick game, okay? Would you rather walk barefoot in a public restroom or monitor standardized tests eight hours straight. You know how difficult it is to to monitor those students. You know, you can't just sit down. You have to monitor them, make sure they're not cheating for eight hours in a row. How long am I walking in the bathroom? Let's, just let's to do your job. Five, let's just call no, let's call it let's call it five minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna, go ahead and say, I'm gonna go ahead and say the bathroom because you can always wash off those feet. You cannot wash off the pain <laughs> yeah. that, that you pain and the wrinkles on your face when you're proctoring a test. Yeah, I, I, I would be on your say. phone. You can't do anything but just look at them. It's terrible. Half of them don't read the directions. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm walking in that bathroom. All right. Would you rather attend a heated meeting with parents if you were a teacher or? a heated meeting with the audience members for a show that you did? I don't know in what world, but all the audience members. Great question. And let me start by saying that teaching and comedy is actually the same thing. Because when you're in the classroom, you're just performing in front of five-year-olds that act like drunk adults. And when you're in <laughs> the comedy club, you're performing for drunk adults who act like five-year-olds. So yeah. being a teacher made me a, bigger, a better comic and vice versa. I'm going to say I'm going to go for the parent because I was so good at that. Like when parents came mm. wrong, I got them correct. Here's <laughs> an example. I had one parent who didn't like, the, you know, I don't sugarcoat about the kids because sugarcoating does nothing but get cavities. So I said to a mom, I told her how her child have, having some behavioral issues and what was going on. She looked at me. She said, Mr. D, I don't think you understand. I pay my taxes. So technically you work for me. Without missing a beat, I looked at her and I said, I pay my taxes too, so technically I'm self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so uh -huh. nice. Uh-uh, they don't pay me enough to deal with you, Pamela? I don't got the time. That's so funny. <laughs> well, Joe, thank you so much for your time. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Teachers, this is teachers, if you're watching, Joe is most likely coming to a city near you. If you already missed it, unfortunately, uh, just go ahead and fo follow him on social media because I'm sure you're going to be doing a tour again. But you have a lot of shows coming up. I know you're coming to the East Coast as well in a couple of months, right? You're coming to Philly. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Uh, please continue on doing what you're doing. We love your content. We love everything about you. Thank you for being a teacher. But more importantly, thank you for being the vessel of change through comedy. Thank you.